my bun. The first reading for today, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. A reading from Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning those shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of the flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will the congregation please turn to our appointed psalm of the day, Psalm 23. I'll be reading it. I'll be reading it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23. The second reading this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. A reading from Ephesians. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember you, that you were at that time without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is the hostility us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he may create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and pro proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will the congregation please rise? Turn to your yellow 
liturgy sheet, join with me in saying the appointed gospel verse. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The appointed gospel lesson for today, for the nice Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 6, beginning with verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told Jesus all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said to them, Come away, come away to a deserted place, all by yourselves, and rest a while. For many, many people were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and, and villages, and they arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and they moored the boat. And when they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and they rushed about the whole region and began to bring their sick on mats to, to whatever they heard where he was. And whenever he went into the villages or cities or towns, they, had, they laid their sick in the marketplaces, and they begged Jesus that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched the fringe of his cloak were healed. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you. Will the congregation please be seated? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on this ninth Sunday after Pentecost, we thank you for the opportunity to come away to come away and to spend some quality time with you, to sit at your feet and to learn and to hear. Lord, help us to understand today's gospel lesson and apply it to our life in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Before I begin this interesting sermon today, I want to say hello to my grandkids, yes, yeah. <laughs> and Corbin, Brecken, and Anders. And so this morning, my daughter, Haley sent a picture of Brecken and his friend sitting under a blanket with their Bibles open watching the sermon on their on the TV. And the kid, he's like, how is he, like 11? He's 11? Yeah. They're taking notes and following along in the Bible with my sermon. That's pretty interesting, right? And it's not that they're listening to me, it's that they had the Bible open yeah. and they were reading it and paying attention. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. So maybe we'll stick that up on the church website. I, I thought that was quite a, quite a picture there. What a blessing. So I, I told Linda, thank you for videoing this. You never know who's watching. You know, We have people watching all over the place. And uh, it's an important thing to do. So all right, now with that, let's go do today's sermon. Now, do you like Thanksgiving? Yeah. You're supposed to say yes, right? You had the turkey, you got the stuffing, you got all the, you know, the sweet potatoes and the marshmallows on the top, all this stuff. What's the best part about Thanksgiving? Friday and Saturday. <laughs> It's leftovers. Do you ever notice that? The leftovers taste better than the Thanksgiving dinner. Well, guess what? That's what today is. Today's gospel lesson is a bunch of leftovers. It's put in the Tupperware container, it's shoved in the back of the refrigerator. And unless you come to church today, this is the kind of stuff that you would probably just sort of skip over and get to the interesting stuff in the Gospel of Mark. So this is like a leftover day today. Now, as I said, the leftovers are the best part of Thanksgiving. You know what? There's some really good stuff in here. So let's take a look at this, and it's kind of crazy. It starts with Mark chapter 6, verse 30, and it goes to 34, and then it skips and goes down to verse 51, 53 through 56. So in other words, you've got like a block of material, and then a blank space, and then a block of material. I don't know about you, but when someone says, don't read that, what do you do? I want to read it. So I, I read this for you. What do we have today? We have a block of material, and it goes from, last week was Herod Antipas and John the Baptist. 
Immediately, today's story begins with verse 30. Then we have verse 30, 35 through 45, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Five loaves and two fishes, 5,000 men, so it's probably 5,000 women and 5,000, 15,000 people he feeds. So they skip that part of the story. Then there's another block of material immediately, and that's John chap uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 46 through 51, which is right before the second section. What is that? Jesus walks on the water. So we're, we're missing the feeding of the 5,000 and the calming of the storm and the walking on the water, and instead we have the leftover stuff today. So keep that in mind as we, as we progress into this. So these stories are interjected, okay? So here we go. Let's start right at the beginning. The apostles gathered around Jesus and they told him all that they had done and taught. Stop. What's going on here? Before the John the Baptist material last week, way up here, it's what Mark chapter six, verse eight, Jesus sends them out two by two. So they've been out teaching. They've been out teaching. They've been out on the countryside, going to the villages, the towns, and they've been and they're teaching. Now, is this an important thing? This is an internship. This is a work study program. What is it? Northeastern College in uh, in the Boston area has like a five year program where you go to work for a semester, you learn engineering, and then you work at a company for a semester, and you go back and forth. By the time you're done, what's more important, your degree? or your work experience. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Uh, a lot of problems, we, we, have, we have problems in modern colleges where you have spent four years in the ivory tower and you never actually, have never actually worked or done anything. So this is, a, this is a work study program. The disciples have been out. Now, what's the most important thing that you do if you do any human endeavor? This is management theory. Okay, ready? This is called process theory. Steve, you must have had this before, okay? You have a project, what is it? It's the process, you wanna do something? Anything in life you wanna do, that's the process. What do you need? Inputs, process, and output. Now, what's missing here? The most important thing in the process model is this. Ready? Here, right, let, me, let, me, let me give you an illustration first. Where's California? 3,000 miles It's over there, man. Okay, so I'm going to go to California. So I'm going to get in my truck and I'm going to drive to California. What's going to happen to me? Am I going to make it to California? Why not? Yeah, that's right. Not my truck, that's right. <laughs> I depend on the goodwill of strangers. That's right. <laughs> yeah, here's what happened. The most important thing with driving anywhere is not knowing where California is, it's this. Right? Hit the brake, speed up the, what is that called? That's called the feedback loop. Okay, so let me draw that. I can't spell feedback here. Too easy. <laughs> okay, see this? Input, process, output, feedback loop. Okay? Correcting yourself is how you keep the car on the road, right? You keep it in the, uh, on this side of the line, you stop at the bridge, you stop at the toll. Okay, so the feedback loop is the most important thing. It's not that the disciples went out teaching, the input, the disciples go, they teach, they come back. No, that's not the, the most important part is the feedback loop. You have to process what you just did. That's where real learning takes place. Does that apply to all things in life? Yeah, it applies to all things in life. When you do something, anything you would take, you would take in life, you want to sit and think about it and go, how could I have done better? What do I do? When Linda films the sermon, she usually posts it on Sunday afternoon and I watch the sermon and then I say, how could it have been better? What could I improve? How could I? You always have to work on your public speaking. You always have to work on anything you, you do in life. You're, a, you're a, a contractor, you build something, uh, you, I don't know, you have a sales deal. Anything you do in life, it's not just the input and the process of the output, it's the feedback. Analyze what you've done and strive to make it better. That's where you learn. That's how you learn. And a good teacher, 
would say something like, okay, you've been out on the field. You, you, now, what did you learn about this? Tell me the hardest thing you did. Tell the easiest thing. What did you learn in your experience out on the road? And you talk about it in a group, right? Because one disciple might have had something happen, and the other disciple didn't. And the other disciple who pays attention can learn from what the experience of another person. When you take a college class, and I, this used, used to make me crazy, someone to ask me a question, right? 35 kids there, and what do immediately, I answer the question, and the other 34 kids in the class check their iPhones and are looking out the window. When someone asks a question, you listen to them. Listen to the question, listen to the answer, and learn from that. That's how you learn. This is what Jesus did. Do we like Jesus? He's a great and noble teacher. Some people, you know, they minimize Jesus. They don't want to say, he's the son of God who died on the cross. They, they, they can't quite bring himself to say that, but they'll all, they all admit he's a great and noble teacher. Well, what kind of teaching techniques did he use? This is what he did, right? The apostles, they come back. Okay, stop. Let me talk about the word apostles for a minute. This is the only time in the Gospel of Mark where Mark calls these people apostles. Every other time, they're disciples. When you read the Bible, there's a distinction between disciples and apostles. Disciples means students, learners. Who are you? Who am I? We are disciples of Christ. We are students of Christ. An apostle is a technical thing. The word is from the Greek means sent out ones, ones who sent out on a mission. They're sent out, that's what it means, dispatched. Apostles, there could only be 12 apostles. Well, what do you mean? An apostle has to be a student of Jesus for three and a half years during his early ministry. He has to have seen the risen Lord. And they are ordained or anointed. They have a special duty to go out after the death, burial, resurrection of Christ and do what? Build the early church. What do we call that creed that we do every week? The Apostles' Creed. Woe unto any church, including us. If we say, well, the Apostles are really nice and everything, but let's add some more interesting stuff to it. It'll help the church grow. That's called apostasy, right? We don't add anything to the words of the Bible. We don't add anything to the teachings of the Apostles. When we come here, We've been talking about the same thing here at St. Paul's Wurtenberg since 1760 when the church was founded. We don't add new stuff to it, right? It's the same thing. It's the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. That's the center. The Apostles' Creed is the teachings of the Apostles. Now, where did the Apostles get their teachings from? From Jesus. So this, he's making disciples, he's making students He's creating disciples by sending them out two by two, and they come back with their action report. What did you learn during internship? And he gathers them around. Why? Because you learn in a group, right? And they report back, and they tell him everything that they did and everything that they taught. What a great thing. What a great thing. In other words, Jesus, the great teacher, has his education system is rooted in real life. What's one of the problems we have today with our education system? We have a lot of problems. One of them is it's only nine months long because it's set up so that the kids can go home and work on the farms during the summer. The problem is only 2% of the American population works on farms now. Most, a lot of kids have single mothers, single, single parent homes. Well, they need to be in school 12 months out of the year. They ought to have nine months of liberal arts and three months of a technical school where you learn plumbing, you learn electrical, you learn cooking or whatever, and, and rotate it around so that the kids get some experience in the real world. Theoretical, ideological gobbledygook doesn't really help you to balance a checkbook. It doesn't teach you how to, uh, I don't know, do a basic thing, like you know, cut, a, cut a board at a right length or something, right? Know how to use a ruler, okay? So there's a complete disconnect. Well, Jesus, he's the perfect teacher. Look what he's doing. Talk about it, right? And so they gather around and he says, look, come away, right? Let's go to a deserted place, a desert. Let's go away all by ourselves and rest a while. Stop, stop, and stop. Is this a very important thing? Mm -hmm. It's extremely important. 
Uh, what's this book here? Um, Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. Okay. This came out in 1970. It's embedded in all business management books. They assume you've read Alvin Toffler. He writes Future Shock, The Third Wave, and Power Shift, eight, uh, 1970, 1980, 1990. And in this book, what's Future Shock? Modern people, postmodern people, that would be us, we get slammed. Boom, 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 boom. One event after another, after another, after another. Look at the last week. They tried to kill President Trump. Biden is probably going to have to drop out of the race because it turns out that he's been having difficulties for like four years and everybody's been covering it up. There's big chaos in the election system. The stock market three or four days ago went up 700 points and then it went down 500 and then 200 the next day. And what did Israel do? Yesterday or the day before, they bombed the Houthi stronghold in Yemen. Well, what is that? Well, that's like World War III. And in, our, in the Ukraine, there's all kinds of hell breaking loose. What's going to happen there? So it's like the news cycle slaps you so you're so overwhelmed that you can't process the information. You can't think, right? It's one thing after another after another. That's called future shock, right? Things change so rapidly you don't have time to absorb it or process what's going on. What do you need to do? Here's what you need to do. You need to rest and retreat. What just happened here? You know, the Holy Bible tells us about how to rest and retreat, don't they? You work really hard six days a week. Now, on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, you rest. What do you do on the Sabbath day? Do something you don't normally do. Go to church. <coughs> Read the Bible. Pray. Go for a long walk. Do nothing. Is, there, is it good to do nothing? Yeah. You know, doing nothing is a wonderful thing. It gives you a time to process, to back up, to sort, to sift it out, to sort it out. I believe in the Holy Bible. What events in the world happen that conflict or undermine Christian social ethics? Thou shalt not murder. It's probably not good to like shoot people, right? So you have to process it. You have to understand what it means. And what happens when you do that? It builds up your faith, believe it or not. God tells us to go to church, go, remember the Sabbath, read the holy book, set time aside. Why? Because God needs a break? No, because you need a rest. It's the solution to future shock. You need to process it. You need to think, about, you need to think it over. You need to just let it, let it go. Work on it. Process it. What does it all mean? I like in the Hasidic Jewish tradition, they have, like a, they have like an old chair, they put it like in the woods. And it's actually a spiritual exercise where you go and you just sit there in the chair and you just do nothing and sit there and think about things. Fantastic. That's kind of neat, isn't it? Right? Of course, we can't do that because we're going to get deer ticks. But, you know, other than that, you put bug spray on before you try this. I think there's something to it, though. So Jesus, he takes them away, they rest, and they retreat. Ask questions like this. What just happened here? What does it all mean? An event is just an event unless you add meaning to it. And I've talked about this before. The Battle of Gettysburg, I lived on the battlefield for four years. July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 1863. Biggest land battle in North American history. What does it mean? Abraham Lincoln delivers the Gettysburg Address November um, 18th, 1863, and he says four score and seven years ago, Abraham Lincoln gave meaning to this hellacious battle, this place of suffering and death, where the Union prevailed. Extremely important. It's not the event, it's the meaning of the event that really is the important thing. What does it mean? That's what you need to do. Rest and retreat. So come away. To a deserted place. Notice, there's no iPhone, uh, there's no Facebook, there's no professional wrestling on TV. It's just alone. And you think about things, and you process it. What does it mean? What does it mean? Sort it all out. Come away and, and rest. Sabbath, rest, that's what that means. What happens? In the middle of this, many were coming and going. 
And there were so many people that followed Jesus, they didn't have time even to eat. Right? Now stop for a minute. What would Jesus do? Jesus doesn't say to these people, get out of here, we're resting. It's me time. It's vacation time. He doesn't say that. He looks at these people and he knows that they hunger. They're starving. What are they starving for? Not only do they need food, feeding of the 5,000 being set up here, they also want to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, the Old Testament ends with Malachi. 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. This is the between the Testament period. It's not the silent years, it's between the Old and New Testament. A lot of things happened during that time, but the consensus even among Jewish scholars is that there were no prophets in the land. No prophets. Suddenly, Jesus appears. And what does he say to these Amorites and these people of the land? Who are they? These are peasant people who are Jews who don't have enough money. They don't have enough money to pay the temple tax, so they can't go to the temple in Jerusalem. And they can't go to the local synagogue because they don't have enough money to pay the temple dues or the synagogue dues. So they're Jews, but they sit outside and they get the crumbs that they can hear through the walls. Jesus stands up and says, you heard it said from men of old, but I say unto you, what? What is that? They're starving. They're starving for a word from God. Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king. There's a prophet in the land, one like Moses, Deuteronomy 18. That's who Jesus is. That's why they were like mobbing him. They couldn't get enough of him. Thousands of people following him around, running after him. They've been starving for 400 years, and all of a sudden now the buffet is open. What a beautiful thing. What an amazing thing. Now, let me talk about this. Is it a burden to have a large following? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people that, oh, that, that woman has 25 million followers on uh, Instagram, mm -hmm. okay? Well, is that a big responsibility? Yeah. If you are popular, if you're in a leadership position, you have a duty to the people to act in a righteous manner. People, people believe and follow you. It's a big responsibility to be a leader. You don't, you, don't, you don't like manipulate the people to try to get more money or more power out of them. You serve these people and you set a moral example for the right way to live and the right way to act and the right thing to do because people are watching you and they want to know. Do you know any non-Christian friends? Yeah, they're all over the place. They're watching you right now. They want to know, what do Christians think about this? What do Christians think about that? What is Christian social ethics? What does it all mean? People are watching you, and they want to know how you react to adversity. They want to know how do you act. You see, what's worse than adversity? Prosperity and success. When people follow you, you better, you better make sure that you're centered on God, right? Incidentally, did you watch the Republican convention? I did. Well, God had a good week last week, didn't he? Right? And... You know, on the back of a dollar bill, what does it say? In God we trust. What does that mean? It doesn't mean the Holy Trinity. I wish it did. It means God in general. So there were some outstanding chaplains that prayed. My favorite was the, the, um, the Detroit uh, preacher from the inner city. I'll tell you what, this guy is good. I'd go to his church. In fact, I'm leaving now. <laughs> that guy rocked the house. He was fantastic. And there was a Missouri Synod pastor, and I got such a kick out of him before he did the, the boring Lutheran prayers, right? He does, he uh, imitates Trump. This is going to be the greatest prayer ever. You know, it was really a funny thing. And there was a woman who did a Sikh prayer. Yeah, who are Sikhs? They're from northern India. They're not Hindu, or they're not, uh, and they're not Islamic. They're like a hybrid between the two, and they're tough as nails. The Sikhs love to fight. So you want to have bodyguards when you go to India that are Sikhs, they're really tough. So she does a prayer. You see, we live in a country that has freedom of religion. We live in a country where you believe in, you're a Lutheran, you're a Baptist, you're a Jew, you're Islamic, whatever, that's great. We celebrate people who believe in God. Anyone who believes in God is my ally. Mm -hmm. 
It might not be the kind of God that I, you know, I think Mormonism is kind of strange, but I admire him. Salt Lake City is a nice, is a nice city and they run a really good state over there. It's kind of interesting, right? So anyway, so God is an important thing in the, in the public square. So, all right, so uh, people are, and people are watching, right? So what happens then? People follow, right? And they go to shore. Right? Now, again, this is where Mark is interested in Jesus on the move. Right? Why is that? He's writing for Greco-Roman readers. Greco-Roman people, they're not interested in philosophical gobbledygook. They want to know about the man of action, Jesus. So they want to know, what does he do? What did time and space? So Jesus at Capernaum, he goes over here to the... the Jewish side of the lake, Gentile side, he goes over here, Gentile side of the lake, he walks on the water, right, all this kind of stuff, feeds the 5,000 up in here, he's moving around, moving around. So you read today's gospel lesson, it's kind of hard to keep straight, where is he at what time? You need like a map with pins on it or something, okay? So Jesus comes ashore, and a great crowd of people followed him from like Capernaum all along the shore, all the way over here to where Pam is sitting, the Gentile side of the lake. So they get off the boat after he walks on the water, he steps on the shore, like the D-Day landing, and here's a thousand people waiting for him, right? Again, they're starving to hear the word. Now again, instead of saying, get out of here, it's me time, I'm busy, he looks at him with compassion. Stop. What does that word mean? Come is with, passion is suffering, with he identifies with the suffering of the people standing on the shore. You know, Bill Clinton is famous for, I feel your pain, okay? Well, that's a pretty good political slogan, but Jesus really does have compassion for these people. He's the real deal. He looks at these people and rather than saying, get out of here, I'm busy, right? Instead, he has compassion on them. Well, what are they? They're like sheep without a shepherd. That's why we read the 23rd Psalm. Vani, that's why you read the first, letting, uh, uh, the first reading from Jeremiah. That's why we have our stained glass window. Why does that speak to us so much? What is it? There are sheep without a shepherd. That means shepherds are leaders. When you don't have a leader, the people go astray. The people get into all kinds of trouble, like sheep. Sheep are so highly domesticated that if they don't have a shepherd, they're gonna die on their own. They'll walk off the edge of a cliff. They don't know where the water is. They don't know where the grass is. You literally have to lead them and the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's why the 23rd Psalm resonates with us so much. You see? And bad shepherds feed on the flock. Good shepherds are willing to die for the sake of the flock. But what are sheep for anyway? Well, let me see. You clip their wool, right? but you kill them and cook them and eat them. Sheep are on the way to being slaughtered. Think about that. When you look at sheep, you should be thankful. Thankful that God gave us such a beautiful animal, but know that their ultimate fate is they're gonna be slaughtered someday. Jesus looks at the sheep and he has compassion and pity on them. That's what Jesus sees when he looks at us. Why did he come into the world? Why did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? Because we're like sheep that are gonna be slaughtered. Either we're gonna kill each other or the, the, the world of flesh and the devil is gonna kill us all. That's why Jesus died for you, to give you eternal life. He doesn't mock the sheep and make fun of the sheep and exploit the sheep and you know, beat the sheep up and abuse the sheep. He has compassion, passion, like passion, suffering of the Christ compassion on them. What does he do? Instead of saying, get out of here, I'm busy. No, he teaches them many things. What's our problem? Our problem is profound ignorance of God. Our problem is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and we've got earbuds in our ear. We're listening to the voice of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The vo we're listening to the, to the words of Satan and we wonder why our lives are messed up. Jesus has words of eternal life. Jesus tells you how to learn to subdue your passions. What does that mean? 
How do you act as a Christian gentleman and a Christian lady? How are you supposed to act in the world? You're supposed to love God and love your neighbor. Do we see a lot of that going on in the world today? I see a, people, a lot of people who despise and mock God. God will not be mocked. You don't stand up and go, God will take me away when my job... No. You don't mock God. You don't do that. And because you mock God, that's why you're so nasty to each other. That's why you abuse other people. You treat other people like they're just objects for your pleasure, for you to be manipulated, to, you, to use. Shame on us, right? So Jesus looks at them and he teaches them many things. Above all, he teaches them about himself. The death, burial, resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel message handed down by, from the apostles, the eyewitnesses to these events. But he also teaches things like the Sermon on the Mount. Read it someday. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's how you're supposed to act as a Christian. Right? He teaches them. Now, he gets over to the Gentile side over here. And what happens? He's getting out of the boat and people, they... They recognize him once and for all. Again, the responsibility of being famous means you have to rise to the occasion and set a moral example. It's extremely important. And people were rushing from all over the region. They're, why? Again, they're starving to hear the gospel. It's been 400 years of no gospel. The whole region. And what do they do? Not only are they broken in their own individual bodies and they want healing, they also bring their sick with them. They bring them on mats. What does it mean to be brought on a mat? That means you can't walk. That means you're not ambulatory. That your friends have to carry you all right, to Jesus. And they know Jesus is the only one that can give us healing and hope. They know where to go, right? These people know. Why? Because the sheep know the master's voice. And they know that there's healing and relief in the voice of the master. And wherever he went, people brought mats. So they did thousands of people coming, right? And they come from the villages and the towns and the farms. And they, and they bring the sick to the marketplace. The marketplace is the agora, the agrophobia, agora. That means the center of town, the town square. That's where all the action in these villages take place. And what do they do? They begged him, right? They begged him, like beggars. They begged him that they might touch what? The fringe of his garment. Wait a minute. You came to church on June 30th. I remember seeing you here. Remember the story of the woman with a 12 year issue of blood? She spent all of her money on doctors and, they, and she got worse. She had no hope. And she, in the middle of a crowd of a thousand people, reaches up to Jesus and she touches the fringe of his garment. Now, who would, be interesting in, who would be interested in knowing that touching the fringe of Jesus' garment will heal people? Well, let me see. Greco-Roman readers, they want to know about the action Jesus. There's not a whole lot of teaching in the Gospel of Mark. It just says that Jesus taught, but it doesn't really give you the content of what Jesus taught. Isn't that interesting? You have to read you know, Matthew and Luke for that information, or John especially for that. They just, Mark just says he taught, and then he gets onto the interesting stuff, which is the action stuff. Touching the fringe of his garment. A Roman, a Roman reader would have read that and went, what kind of power does this guy have? Dunamos, dynamite, I mean, that's the Greek word for power. What kind of power does he have? He's so powerful that if you touch the fringe of his garment, you can be healed? Is, what's the question of Mark again? Remember, the Gospel of Mark ends with this. The centurion, who is Roman, standing at the feet of the cross, and he says, truly this is the Son of God. Every little event, even the leftovers that we have today in today's text, every little story in Mark leads you to ask the question, who is this guy? Who is this? I've never seen anything like this before. Who is this one? He has compassion on us, the sheep. He, he, he walks on water. He feeds the 5,000 people. He calms the storm. He's the one who has disciples around him and he spends time teaching them. Who, who is this person? Who is this person that when people come from all over and bring mats with their sick and they touch the fringe of his garment and they're healed and made whole? Who is this person? When you come to church, you always want to say, who is this Jesus? Who is he? 
He's 100% God and 100% man. That's who He is. He died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross because the world is messed up. Sin and death entered the world. Sin and death entered the world. That's why the world is a mess. And it's not a politician that's going to save us. No, it's faith in God, faith in Christ, the Son of God that will save you. That will redeem not only the nation, it will redeem you and your family. That's why we're Christian. That's why you believe in Jesus. When people talk about God on TV at the convention, that's a good thing. But you need to say, who is this God? What does this God look like? This is what this God looks like. It looks like a man hanging on a cross. Agape, love, willing to die for the sake of the other person. That's what Jesus did. He died for you. He died for you. The good shepherd died for the sheep, and that's us. This is a remarkable thing. When you read about this story, even the leftovers point to Jesus. Even the leftovers should drive us to the, ask the question, who is this man? Who is he? For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever, what does that mean? It means um, not just German people and Northern European people, which of course we know we're the chosen ones. <laughs> it also means anyone. He doesn't care about your money doesn't care about your nationality, doesn't care about your political affiliation, he doesn't care about anything. He cares about you as an individual. God so loved the world, he sent his only son that all who believe, all means all, all who believe in him will not perish, that's where we're going, but you'll have eternal life. Who is this man? His name is wonderful. The mighty counselor, the prince of peace, the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he's our savior. Amen.